Um, I had directed the witness's attention to uh, tab 35, plaintiff's exhibit 1869. And is this an article that you wrote uh, that was published in the Santa Clara Law Review in 2001? Yes. Um, I would uh, offer this, Your Honor. No, no objection, Your Honor. Very well. Plaintiff's 1869 is admitted. Um, let me ask you to look at page 9 of this article. Um, yes. The second full paragraph. The first sentence reads, Moreover, by limiting the opportunities for opponents and other interested parties to participate in the process, the initiative system makes compromise and consensus building less necessary than in legislature. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you wrote that, did you not? I did. Um, and obviously you believed it at the time, correct? Um, that was uh, my interpretation of it at the time, yes. Um, do you agree with that today? I, I still believe that's a fair statement, yes. Um, let me ask you to look at the uh, last sentence of that paragraph. It really deals with the same subject matter. It says, in allowing proponents to eschew compromise and accommodation of competing interests, the initiative process fosters polarization rather than consensus building. You see that? Yes, I do. And uh, you wrote that um, at the time, correct? Uh, yes, I did. Believed it at the time, correct? Uh, yes, I did. Now, I think I would probably write it somewhat differently now. Um, uh, that may always be true. The question is whether you believe this to be true or not. Um, More or less, yes. Um, um, let me ask you to look next uh, at page six. Um, the um, last full sentence uh, reads, thus in California, both initiative constitutional amendments and initiative statutes undermine the authority and flexibility of representative government. Do you see that? Yes. And what did you mean there by representative government? I'd have to probably go back and look a little bit. But in general, what I, would, um, I meant at this time was that um, initiatives uh, have the tendency, not always the case, but have the tendency uh, of making it more difficult for the legislature to do its job. For example, by locking in um, spending mandates or, um, or other things. And so um, I think that's a, that's a fair uh, characterization of my views on this. Um, let me ask you to look next at tab 82, which is in volume. And this is a chapter that you and Professor Bruce Kane wrote. The chapter was entitled The Populist Legacy, Poland Initiatives and the Undermining of Representative Government. And that was published in a book um, titled Dangerous Democracy? Question Mark, the Battle Over Ballot Initiatives in America. Is that correct? That's correct. And I, I believe it was published in 2001, about the same time as the Santa Clara article. 
And uh, let me direct your attention um, to the bottom of page 33 um, and the last full sentence. It reads, we discuss how, ironically, direct democracy can actually be less democratic than representative democracy in that it fails to maximize democratic opportunities for refinement, informed deliberation, consensus building and compromise, and violates democratic norms of openness, accountability, competence, competence, and fairness. Do you see that? Yes, I do. When you were referring to direct democracy, were you referring to initiatives? Yes, this was my, what I call the Madisonian critique of the initiative process. Um, uh, and let's go on to page 41. I assume you're moving in 2857. Uh, Your Honor, I am. I would offer Exhibit 2857. 857 is admitted. Um, let me turn to page 41. Uh, the last uh, paragraph at the bottom of the page ends the direct democracy mechanisms that pose the greatest challenge to representative government are the forms of the popular initiative. Do you see that? Yes. Then, going to the uh, last full sentence on that page, you write, quote, initiative constitutional amendments, parentheses, ICAs, close parentheses, most seriously undermine representative government because they can only be altered by another constitutional amendment. You see that? Yes, I do. And um, uh, those obviously um, represented your views at the time, correct? Yes, when I say undermine representative government, the same way as I did my prior answer. And, and defining undermining representative government the same way you defined it in your prior answer. Yes. You still believe this is an accurate statement? I don't think it's always the case. No, I think it uh, can be. And so this doesn't sort of uh, clarify how frequently this occurs. I think it can be the case, yes. And indeed, I, I don't think you say here that it's always the case. No, I don't. But it's true that an initiative constitutional amendment can only be altered by another constitutional amendment. It could be put on the ballot by the legislature, not by initiative. But it would still have to be passed by the, by the people, correct? I, if we're talking about California, yes, yeah. yes. Um, uh, and um, uh, let me ask you to look at page 43. Um, and let me ask you to look at the paragraph that be begins under the heading Undermining Democratic Opportunities. Yes. Right, a well-functioning democratic system provides opportunities for refinement, informed deliberation, consensus building, and compromise. Legislative procedures tend to maximize these opportunities, whereas the initiative process, by its nature, undermines them. You see that? Uh, yes, I do. And uh, you obviously believe that at the time you wrote it, correct? Yes, I did. Does that reflect your current views? Uh, I think there are certain circumstances uh, in which deliberation can occur in the initiative process in various ways. Um, as I've done more research on the initiative process, I've had I would I would modify these in in certain respects. This this that particular sentence. <coughs> Saying is that in some cases there could be opportunities for a compromise in the initiative process? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I think I said informed deliberation, but compromise and consensus building, all, all of these things. There's certainly opportunities. Um, there are opportunities. In the, in the initiative process, yes. Now, um, you've studied a lot of initiatives. 
Yes, I have. 900, more than 900. <laughs> okay. Now, of those 900-plus initiatives, in how many of those initiatives were there what you would refer to as refinement, informed deliberation, consensus building, and compromise? Uh, that's difficult to say because what I've looked at is the outcome of the initiative as opposed to really the, the formation of it. But I, I do know that under certain circumstances, there are opportunities where the proponents of initiatives will uh, be forming a coalition, for example, among various different groups to put the ballot measure on the ballot. So oftentimes there's compromise that goes on in the formation at the, at the proponent stage. So I, I just don't want to leave the impression that this is always the case. Uh, the, the point is that the legislative process uh, builds in these things and the initiative process, it can happen, but it doesn't always happen. And um, uh, can you give me any indication based on your study of these 900 plus initiatives, how many times it has happened in history where there has been uh, significant informed deliberation, consensus building and compromise in the formulation of an initiative? I can only give anecdotal examples. Um, How many examples could you give? I don't know today. Um, Is there now? I want to do a few? I don't know. <laughs> I'm asking you how many. I don't know. I'd have to think about it, maybe three or four or five. I don't know. Um, um, that's without any serious investigation of the, um, you know, the the drafting process of these of these measures. So what you're saying is that you've not done any serious investigation of how these 900 initiatives were drafted and came to be put on the ballot. Or even really the, the campaigns um, for the most part. It's because I'm doing a very large study. I'm more looking at the, the outcomes of initiatives and then what happens to them after the um, um, after the election. Do you agree that in the legislate, le legislator and legislative procedures, you have these opportunities for refinement, informed deliberation, consensus building, and compromise? And what you're saying is that could occur or could not occur in the initiative process, depending on what people did. Yeah, I think I should also amend the first part of your statement a little bit because this provides a, a somewhat um, idealized picture of the, of the legislature. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say that legislatures don't, don't always provide all of those four um, uh, opportunity, or they don't always live up to that ideal of providing opportunities for refinement, informed deliberation, consensus building, and compromise. No doubt that there are more opportunities in the legislature than in the initiative process, correct? A lot more legislation in the legislature as well as a lot more opportunities for what you refer to here as refinement, informed deliberation, consensus building, and compromise. You're not, you're not disagreeing that there's more opportunity for that in the legislature. Well, the institutional structure of the legislature is set up for those four things. That's why I wrote that, right? And the initiative yes. process is um, it's, it's not as uh, structured in that way. And um, if there's going to be any compromise or refinement or informed deliberation in the initiative process, it's going to be in the formation of the proposal, correct? Because once it's, once it's out there, it can't be amended, right? Well, in terms of deliberation, a lot of deliberation happens during the campaign stage of, among the voters. That's yes or no, correct? The voters can only vote yes or no on a proposition, right? That's correct. They can't amend it, they can't modify it, they can't refine it, correct? In California, at least, there's no opportunity. Once, once the proponents put it out for signature, there's no opportunity to amend the uh, uh, initiative. The only thing they could do is pull it back and redraft it and then recirculate. How many times does that happen in the 900 initiatives you've looked at? In some states, it happens a lot. In Oregon, it happens. California, how often does that happen? Not infrequently. When was the last time it happened? Where they pulled it back, made a compromise, and put it back out again. Last time it happened in California. I guess probably last year. I'm not year. asking you to guess. I'm okay. asking you to tell me. Um, 
I, I can't tell you the specific initiative, but I know it's a frequent thing if you go to the um, Secretary of State's website, they have different versions of a particular proposal, and the proponents are trying to figure out what's the best version of the proposal, and they throw out, they put out different versions, and they have discussions among themselves. So it's, it's a frequent, I would say in California it's frequent, I can't give you a number of times it's happened. When was the last time in California that you know of where an initiative was drafted, signatures were collected, was put out there, and then the proponents pulled it back because they wanted to modify it and put out something else? Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the special election in 2005. There was something along those lines, but I, I think they actually did not pull it back. But there was discussion about it, yeah. What I'm asking is when yeah. they did pull it yeah. back, okay? I mean, that, 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 this, well, does, this well, just doesn't happen in California, does in it? In terms of the circulation, once it, once it gets on the ballot? Yes, yes. Well, once, it's, once they start circulating the petitions. No, I think it does happen. Okay, when was the last time it happened? I, I can't tell you. Approximately. I don't know. Give me, tell me any example that you can remember from your research when that happened in California. I said I can't tell you. Just one example. I'm more familiar in Colorado and some other We're states. We're talking about California, trying to talk about California. You said you wanted to talk about California. So talking about California, give me an example if you have one. Your Honor, this is badgering the witness. It's been asked and answered many times. Objection overruled. Cross-examination. I don't have an example, sir. I, I don't have any example that I can give you. Okay. Um, let me go back uh, to the chapter that you wrote with uh, Professor Kane. Um, and for the record, who is Professor Kane? Uh, that's Professor Bruce Kane, who's a professor at University of California, Berkeley. And uh, is he a well regarded uh, scholar? Uh, in this area? I believe so, yes. Um, let me ask you to um, look at uh, page 45. have a heading there that says violating democratic norms. You see that? Yes. And the first sentence says, the actual operation of the initiative process violates a number of norms that have evolved in advanced democracies. You see that? Yes, I do. What were the norms that you were referring to there? I'm trying to get the context here. I think it's the norms that are listed in the in the succeeding paragraphs. Those are the norms of openness, accountability, and competence and fairness. Is that right? That's right. Um, uh, let me ask you to go back and look at your Santa Clara Law Review article. I know where that is. Page three, uh, tab 35. Uh, and, uh, first full paragraph, the first sentence. Of which page? Of page 10. The first, the first full paragraph, beginning in sum. Yes. Uh, and, and the first sentence there reads, quote, in sum, it is ironic that initiatives have the reputation of being a more pure form of democracy 
when the process undermines democratic opportunities and violates procedural guarantees observed by almost every freely elected legislature in the world. What were the democratic opportunities and procedural guarantees that you were referring to there? I think with respect to the opportunities, it was what we were describing um, in terms of consensus building, compromise, deliberation, those types of things. What about procedural guarantees? What were you talking about there? Not sure. It might have been um, the the things like openness that we were uh, you just asked about something else. or norms that we talked Before about. Four norms, yes. Um, now let me ask you to turn to tab eighty nine. Plaintiffs Exhibit 2864, and this was a amicus brief of William Estridge and Bruce Kane uh, to the Supreme Court of California um, uh, in connection with um, that court's consideration of Proposition 8. Um, first, um, Mr. Estridge here is the uh, professor that you've identified as an expert in the field, correct? Of um, uh, when we were, we were talking about uh, writers who do uh, LGBT rights issues. Yes. Okay. Yes, that was the one. And uh, Bruce Kane is the um, professor that you identified as an expert in uh, political science and initiatives, correct? Uh, yeah, he would be considered an expert in those fields. Um, I want to, uh, Your Honor, I would ask yeah, that you take judicial notice of this um, brief. No objection. Well, 2864 is noted in the purpose. Um, First, uh, let me ask you to look at page four, footnote two. It says, at present, 30 states have state constitutional bars to marriage for same-sex couples, all of them adopted by popular initiatives. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, can you confirm that from your own knowledge, sir? I believe that's an incorrect statement. That is an incorrect statement? Yes. Um, uh, all right. Um, how many states have constitutional bars to same-sex marriage, as you understand it? I believe it's about that number, 30 or so. About 30. About 30. Um, and how many of those have been adopted by popular initiatives? I think it's in the neighborhood of 10, something like that. 10? I believe it's 10. It's. Um, and how were the other 20 adopted? Uh, I might not have the numbers exactly like 10 and 20, but I think most of them were adopted by the legislature putting the constitutional amendment on the ballot and the voters approving the amendment, the DOMA amendment. There are not 30 states in the United States that have um, in the initiative process. Let me, um, let, me, let me see if I understand what you're saying. Um, you're saying that the thir 30 states have constitutional bars to same-sex marriage. You agree with that part? I do agree with that. Okay. What you're saying is that um, you're saying they weren't adopted by popular initiatives. First, um, all of these 30 states 
constitutional bars were presented to the people for a vote. Do you agree with that? That's correct. That's typically true of states that in order to amend the Constitution, you need a popular vote. And would you agree that every time the issue of whether to permit or bar same-sex marriage has been presented to a popular vote, the result has been a bar on same-sex marriage? No. I not agree with that? I would not. Okay. When was there a different result? I'm forgetting the year, but it was in Arizona. What happened there? Voters defeated a DOMA amendment. And Arizona doesn't have um, same-sex marriage, right? No, it does not. What, what are you saying was defeated? There was an initiative put on the ballot by citizens, um, an initiative constitutional amendment, and it was uh, it would have limited marriage to between a man and a woman, and I think it maybe had some other provisions, and it was defeated by the voters um, in a general election. Um, is there any other example that you have? I believe in Colorado there were a couple of options, and the voters approved one and rejected the other. And those are the only... Are talking about Col number Colorado 2? No, I'm talking about, about, I'm talking about a marriage amendment in Colorado. Um, I think they're on the same ballot, though. So it's a different situation than Arizona. I want to get your testimony. In Colorado, were the voters presented with a question of whether or not to permit same-sex marriage? Yes, they were. And what was the vote? I believe to permit it or not to permit it? To not permit. Okay. Now, let me take Arizona, okay? Yes. Um, uh, is Arizona the only example that you have where the voters voted not to bar same-sex marriage? As I said, in the Arizona, uh, voters voted not to bar same-sex marriage. I question you. And then the, and I, let me finish the answer. Um, in Colorado, I believe there were two options, and the voters rejected one and adopted the other. Yes. But in Colorado, you've already said the voters voted to bar same-sex marriage, correct? Yes, they did. Okay. Now, what I was asking you about was any state that voted not to bar same-sex marriage. You understand? Yeah, I, I guess maybe, maybe, the conf, maybe the confusion in Colorado is there were two options. They voted no on one and yes on the other. Okay. Um, that's my understanding of the Colorado situation. So, so is in that the, Colorado or Arizona? No, in, in Arizona, um, uh, Arizona in, in uh, one year, and I'm forgetting the year, whether it was, I think it was 06, voted no on um, uh, a state initiative constitutional amendment uh, to limit marriage between a man and a woman. It was a close vote. The legislature then put um, a legislative constitutional on, amendment on the ballot. I believe that was in 08, and the voters approved that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the legislature put a DOMA, a Defense of Marriage Amendment, on the ballot and the voters approved it in Arizona. That was following the rejection in the prior election cycle. Let me just clarify that for the court, okay? First, we've talked about Colorado and Arizona. Yes. And we've agreed that in Colorado, the voters voted to bar same-sex marriage, correct? Yes, they did. Now, in Arizona, the voters have now voted to bar same-sex marriage, correct? Yes, when after they approved a legislative constitutional amendment that was put on the ballot by the legislature. And, and, it, and it passed. The people voted for it, right? Second time around, it passed. So um, in Arizona, it took two times, right? And I believe the text was different the second time. It still barred same-sex marriage, correct? That's... 
uh, the content of the second measure, yes. And are you aware of any state where, other than Arizona, where it took more than two times, or took more than one time? Are you aware of any state other than Arizona where it took more than one time for the voters to bar same-sex marriage? No. Um, now uh, let me ask you to look at um, tab 89. This is the um, amicus brief by Professors Eskridge and Kane. Um, let me ask you in this connection. to um, look at um, page 7. And I want you to look at the first full paragraph. Any proposition 8? Yes. And um, Professors Eskridge and Cain here talk about hyper amendability. You see that? Yes. Is that a term you're familiar with? Uh, it's not a term I use, but I think Bruce Cain has used that term before. Yes, I've, I've seen that. And what does it mean? Um, I, I believe his view is that um, it's too easy for state constitutions to be amended. I'm, I haven't read this uh, amicus brief, and so I'm not sure if it, that's exactly how he's using it, but that's my understanding of his view on this issue. Um, now, uh, he says Proposition 8 at issue in this case is an even more troubling example of hyper amenability than Proposition 115 or perhaps even Proposition 14. Now, first, do you know what Proposition 115 and Proposition 14 are? Uh, 115 was a, called a victim's rights initiative, if I'm recalling correctly, and Proposition 14, I mean, there's a lot of Proposition 14s, we repeat the numbers, but I assume he's meaning the one from 1964, I believe. Um, that was where the people of California passed a proposition that um, overruled legislative rules that had been enacted um, prohibiting racial discrimination in property transactions, correct? That's correct. Um, <coughs> professors Eskridge and Cain then go on to say, quote, in contrast to Proposition 115, which applied to all citizens who might in the future be charged with a crime, Proposition 8 takes away a fundamental constitutional right from just a minority. In contrast to Proposition 14, where the discrimination was found in the motivations of proponents, Discrimination is on the face of Proposition 8. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, first, um, do you agree that uh, the discrimination that is referred to here is on the face of Proposition 8? No, I don't. Um, uh, didn't you uh, give an example earlier? of uh, laws prohibiting same-sex marriage as an example of discrimination against gays and lesbians? Um, I believe I said it treated them differently. Um, uh, and I mean, the record will show what it shows, but I think I was asking you for examples of discrimination. Um, uh, is it your testimony that you think that a law like Proposition 8 is not discrimination against gays and lesbians? Um, I think what it does is it establishes um, marriage as between a man and a woman. It has a different, it, it excludes 
um, other forms of marriage. My question, and this is, uh, uh, I think, can be answered yes or no. Um, uh, you've said that it treats gays and lesbians differently, correct? Uh, I said that just a moment ago. Yeah, if, if, if same-sex couples want to marry under, the, under this law, they, can, they cannot do so. Right. Now, what I'm asking is whether that different treatment amounts to what you as a political scientist refers to as discrimination or not, if you have an opinion. The extent that we're saying that uh, differential, I, mean, I, I say it's differential treatment, whether it's legally discrimination, I don't know. As a political scientist, not as a lawyer, but as a right. political scientist, um, you study discrimination, correct? Correct. And, um, uh, and is it fair to say that in the area of political science that discrimination has a un understanding and people know what they mean when they talk about discrimination. There's, there's different definitions. There's invidious discrimination. Discrimination is discerning between or choosing between two different things, making distinctions. That's, that's my understanding of, of discrimination. And some discrimination is permissible and others is not. And right now, I'm not asking you to make a legal judgment as to whether this discrimination is legal or not legal. I'm just saying it's clear that on the face of it, there's discrimination, right? It makes a distinction between these two types of couples, yes. And under that definition of discrimination, it's discrimination. Um, and, and just to tie that down, when you say under that definition, that is a definition that would be commonly used by political scientists. Is that fair? I don't know the answer to that. It was at least used by... Professor Eskridge and Kane, correct? Yes. And those are very highly regarded scholars in the political science field, correct? I, I don't disagree. I, I don't agree with their analysis here, but they're highly regarded, no doubt. Well, when you say you don't agree with their analysis, um, I thought you just told me that you didn't know whether the definition of discrimination that you just used was or was not something that was commonly used in political science. Didn't you just tell me that? Well, when I say I don't know that I, I, that I agree with them, it's that whole paragraph you read to me. I mean, there's a lot embedded in there that I don't agree with. Let, let me try to ask you to focus on the question I'm asking you. Right. They say that the discrimination in Proposition 8 is on the face of Proposition 8. That's what I'm talking about. And just so we don't have to go through this again, right. you told me um, that uh, Proposition 8 on its face treated people differently uh, and under that definition of discrimination, it was discriminating against them. You told me that, right? Just a few minutes ago. It, it creates a distinction between the two groups, yes. Sir, um, I think we're going backwards. Um, uh, what I was trying to do was get you to tell me whether the definition of discrimination that you used in the answer when you said under that definition of discrimination it would be discrimination. And I asked you then is that commonly used in by political scientists and you said I don't know. Do I know that, that I would say political scientists use a lot of different definitions of discrimination and so I don't know whether my Def I, mean, I think it's a dic dictionary definition to draw distinctions is discrimination. And so they would use that. They might have other meanings of discrimination depending on their research. This is very common in scholarship that people define terms and they use them in various ways. Yes, and is there a definition that you have that would make Proposition 8 discrimination or not discrimination? Is there a definition you personally have as a political scientist? Yes, no. So, so yes. Or I don't know. Oh, well, okay. Okay, let me let me try to move this forward. Okay. My my view is that Proposition Eight um, makes distinctions, and in that sense, it discriminates between these two different categories. It makes 
uh, a distinction in terms of discriminating. Whether it's invidious discrimination, that's a different question. And Professor Zestrig and Cain don't address whether it's invidious or not in this. I think it's implied clearly in there. Here it's implied that it is invidious. I believe so, yes. Um, um, let me um, let me ask you to um, uh, look at page 17 of this amicus brief. Um, and uh, at the end of the last full sentence there, um, we talk about class legislation that takes away a fundamental constitutional right from a minority that has traditionally been the object of prejudice and stereotyping. Do you see that? I want to read the whole sentence once sure. again. Yeah. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me read the, the whole paragraph. Okay. As this court recognized in in re marriage cases, sexual orientation is a suspect classification for the same reasons race and sex are. And marriage is a fundamental right for lesbian and gay couples, just as it is for interracial couples whose rights were protected in Perez v. Sharp. The whole point of a constitution, according to social contract theory, the founders of our nation, and the terms of our state constitution is to entrench guarantees that all, emphasize all, citizens can count on. A natural reading of Article 18, in light of these constitutional commitments, is that higher hurdles must be surmounted before the voters can essentially add to the constitution class legislation that takes away a fundamental constitutional right from a minority that has traditionally been the object of prejudice and stereotyping. Now, my question is whether you agree that gays and lesbians are a minority that has traditionally been the object of prejudice and stereotyping, as the professors say here. I think we're getting into the realm of history, Your Honor. I renew my objection. Um, I think this takes it up to the present time, Your Honor. Section of the rule. So gays and lesbians are a, a minority. They have been uh, the object of prejudice and stereotyping in the past. And I, as I indicated in my uh, direct testimony, I believe that there's been a, a significant change in that in recent years. Do you believe that gays and lesbians are still the object of prejudice and stereotyping today? I think like a lot of groups, they are, yes. Can I say that again? So like a lot of groups, they face some stereotyping and some prejudice. Today, uh, do you believe that gays and lesbians um, suffer more as the object of prejudice and stereotyping than do African Americans. African Americans still face a lot of prejudice and stereotyping. Again, it's it's a comparative analysis that would be difficult for me to do. Not done it. I have not done it. You don't have an opinion on that today, correct? That's correct. I don't. Um, uh, do you believe that gays and lesbians today? are more the object of prejudice and stereotyping than women. Again, I think women still face a lot of prejudice and stereotyping, and I haven't, I haven't done a comparative, comparative analysis now. Professor Miller, um, granting that women still today face a large amount of prejudice and stereotyping, is it really your testimony that you can't tell whether they face uh, more or less 
prejudice and stereotyping than gays and lesbians? I think I'd have to look more closely at it, actually. I, I think there's a lot of um, anti-female stereotyping in our society today. I'm, I'm not disputing that. I'm just pressing you on the idea that in our society today, women are, or could be, as much the object of prejudice and stereotyping as gays and lesbians. Again, I would have to take a closer look at that. I haven't done the comparative analysis. Well, let me leave gays out of the equation for a minute and just talk about lesbians. Um, would you agree that lesbians face all of the prejudice and stereotyping of women generally, plus more? That's a fair statement. But at least with respect to lesbians, they've got to be more the object of prejudice and stereotyping than women, correct? This is, yeah, the same thing. Sorry, what? Yeah, I would have the same answer, yes. Um, um, let me ask you to look at page 19. Four lines from the bottom, the sentence that begins, for example. Here, Professors Estrig and Kane say, the proponents of Proposition 8 centrally maintained that state recognition of same-sex marriage would require, emphasize require, schools to teach vulnerable children that, quote, gay marriage, close quote, is just as good as, quote, traditional marriage, close quote. That claim has no basis and its acceptance by some voters probably made the difference between the gay minorities having the same marriage rights as the straight majority and having no marriage rights at all. Do you see that? I'm, I'm reading it. One second. I see, the, I see the sentence, yes. Um, now, um, I take it that, um, well, let me ask you, um, uh, do you have an opinion as to uh, whether what they say here um, is accurate or not? I assume that you don't, but I just, if you do, I have it. Objection beyond the scope of direct, Your Honor. I didn't ask the witness about the campaign uh, relating to Proposition 8. I think this line of inquiry does pursue the testimony that he gave on direct, and therefore the objection would be overruled. Do you have an opinion as to whether um, Professors Eskridge and Kane um, are correct um, when they say that claim has no basis and its acceptance by some voters probably made the difference between the gay minorities having the same marriage rights as the straight majority and having no marriage rights at all. Yes, I have an opinion. On that. Uh -huh. Yes, I do have an opinion. Um, and do you agree or disagree? I think there, there is a basis with respect to the, um, the curricular uh, consequences of Proposition 8. And so the first clause, the claim has no basis. Um, I don't agree with that. Um, the second clause, with regard to the impact of that message, is it probably made the difference between um, the gay uh, minorities having the same marriage rights as the straight majority 
and having no marriage rights at all. Um, there's a lot embedded in that. Um, first of all, in, in terms of the message's impact on the um, outcome of the election, I don't actually know. I'm sorry, what? I don't actually know. I mean, there are a lot of different messages going on in the campaign. And if you don't know, you don't know. Okay. Um, uh, th as you say, they make two statements here. One is the claim that state recognition of same-sex marriage would require schools to teach vulnerable children that gay ch marriage is just as good as traditional marriage. Um, they say that claim has no basis. You say, no, I disagree with that. I think that claim does have basis. I think it, it could be shown to have a basis, yes. Could be shown to have a basis. Um, has anybody shown it to have a basis that you're aware of? Um, I think the analysis that was done by the proponents of Proposition 8 with respect to um, existing California state education requirements um, there's, uh, in terms of the curriculum in the public schools and what the potential impact of uh, the passage of Proposition 8 would be had a basis. You know, I don't know if it's um, actually correct or not. I don't, it hasn't been tested in the courts. I assume if Proposition 8 were passed and there was um, uh, you know, a curricular move under existing state law to make this happen, and there would be challenges to it. So I don't know actually whether it would have happened or not, but I think there was a basis for believing it could have happened, yes. Second part is that that claim and its acceptance made the difference in the election or made the difference in the vote. And that's something you say you don't have an opinion, you do not have an opinion on, is that correct? Um, I, I'd say it's, it's hard to say because there were so many messages in the campaign. And so... I'm not asking you why you don't have an opinion. I'm just asking you whether you have an opinion as to whether that's accurate or not. It was, if it said possibly made the difference, then I might be able to adopt that. If it probably made the difference, I can't, I can't say. Okay. Um, Definitely made the difference, which is what they say. You can't say that either, right? No, so they say probably made the difference. So if they said definitely, I would say I disagree with that. If they say probably, I don't know, possibly, I would agree with it. I just want to understand your logic. Um, you said you didn't know whether it made a difference or not. Right? You didn't know whether that was the difference in the election. And I see election, I mean vote. The vote, right. Um, it, was a, it was a factor out there. There are a lot of other factors, and I can't, I haven't done any polling on this. I don't know anyone else who has, who can say that that message about the curricular, the potential curricular impact of Proposition 8 made the difference in the election, which is what is the claim here, right? You just don't know whether that's right or not, correct? I don't. And if, okay. I, I think it's fair to say that if they definitely, they said it definitely made the difference, then I would have a lot of reservations about that. Given, given that there's no basis for proof that I've seen, no polling data, um, survey data that said, why did you vote for Proposition 8? Um, are you aware of polling data as to why people voted for Proposition 8? Um, I haven't seen any extensive polling data on that now. Um, no. You haven't seen any extensive. Um, let me ask you whether you've seen any polling data on uh, why people voted for Proposition 8. I'm trying to think. I saw the, I've certainly seen the exit polls about the vote, but I, I can't recall. Um, reading a poll that said, why did you vote for Proposition 8, a, a large poll on that. You just put in a large poll. Um, um, I will get to whether the poll was extensive. I will get to whether the poll is large. But what I'm now asking you is just whether you've seen any data at all as to why people voted for Proposition 8. I, I actually think I may have, but I don't recall what it is, yeah. Well, let me ask you to look at tab 78. As you do that, Mr. Boyce, let me ask uh, about how 
you're doing in your examination of this witness. Uh, as you can tell, it's rather warm in here, and our yes. landlord uh, shuts down the uh, ventilation at 5 o'clock. And, uh, uh, Your Honor, I will not finish by 5, and this would be a convenient time to break. Very well. Well, then let's do it. And we'll resume at 8.30 tomorrow morning. <laughs>